Ask someone to name a type of pollinator, and bees are likely to be the answer, with butterflies coming in a close second. But when it comes to pollination, there is a very important group of insects that is often forgotten, the moths. The moths are a large and diverse group of Lepidoptera and are vitally important in the pollination of many plants, some of which are quite rare, along with being a food source for a ton of critters, both as caterpillars and adults. Shannon had a chance to talk with Jim McCormick, co-author of the book, Gardening for Moths, a regional guide on an episode of the Backyard Ecology podcast about the ecological importance of moths. We often hear people talk about wanting to create pollinator gardens or um, butterfly gardens. And that's usually when they say pollinator gardens, they're thinking butterflies and bees, or at least that's been my experience. But, and, and we don't even think about the moths which is why one of the reasons I was so excited about your book, because it does open up this whole other way to look at our gardens and the habitat that we're trying to create around our homes. Because if we really want to create thriving ecosystems on our property, we need to be thinking more about moths because they play such a vital role in the ecosystem in so many different ways. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. The the butterflies are young pikers. Um, and just a piddling little pool of Lepidopter compared to the moths. You know, if we take my home state of Ohio, where I'm sitting right now, uh, there's about 164 species of butterflies that have ever been recorded here. This is the rare stuff, too. And even the vagrants that wander up once in a blue moon from the south or something like that, 164 species we have a woman, she's profiled in the book, uh, Diane Brooks, who is probably the most expert, uh, prolific mother in the state of Ohio. On her 12 and a half acre property in Perry County, Ohio, Southeast Ohio, she's up to something like 15 or 1600 species of moths on that one property. So, I mean, we, we have no idea how many moths are in Kentucky or state or Ohio. Uh, we just don't know enough about them, but it absolutely dwarfs the um, pile of butterflies next to it, which diverged far later in the evolution of the lineage Lepidoptera. You know, the, it started with moths, and moths are way more speciose. I never like to say more important relatively because it's just not fair to do that, but yeah. um, they're doing a lot more heavy lifting, at least you could argue, than butterflies ever would. And we wouldn't have songbirds, for instance, if it weren't for moths, because the caterpillars are so important to the uh, diets of songbirds and non-songbirds like cuckoos. We would not have cuckoos for sure if we didn't have moths, because that's their primary food source. Yes, exactly. In many ways, I would say moths are a keystone group of organisms as much as the oaks or anything else that we think of often as the keystone groups of organisms, just because they do feed so much as caterpillars, as adults, um, and then their whole role in pollination that often gets overlooked as well. Yeah. You know, one of the things, thanks for mentioning that because uh, yeah, of course they're wonderful pollinators, just in general, butterflies are uh, rather smooth. That's one of the differentiations people ask us all the time. And by the way, I should mention this uh, now, or I, I don't want to forget it, because half of that book was Chelsea Gottfried, my co-author, who's a wonderful entomologist and writer and photographer. And uh, It was a complete 50-50 thing. I approached her about the idea because I think someone needed to go to bat a little more seriously for these underdogs, the moths. But she was all over it. And uh, so it was very much a mutual project. But um, both of us give a lot of talks on this. And uh, people often ask, uh, how do you tell a moth from a butterfly, which is a really legitimate question. But in general, butterflies are smooth, their bodies and uh, moths are big fuzzy bags, you know, it's like an engineer probably would say these should not be able to fly. You know? um, but they do fly and they're just little balls of fuzz flying around when they land on a flower every pollen grain available sticks to them, um, including in amazing ways. Sorry, I tend to go off the rails occasionally with stories, oh, but I love it. We, we were doing a mothing event last year, and there's this young woman, she's 18 now, but Nora Tempest, and Nikki, her mother, and Nora were at this event. Nora's incredibly sharp-eyed, and she comes over to me, and she goes, Jim, Jim, look at this. 
and it was this wonderful moth called a zebra concholotes perched near the light. Looks like a zebra, black and white. Wonderful thing. But she goes, look, there's something wrong with its eyeball or something like that. And I look and I knew exactly what it was. And I'd been wanting to see this forever. I wish I could pull up a photo because I have killer photos of this. But it was the pollinia of an orchid called crane fly orchid. Uh, only a very small group of moths pollinate crane fly orchids. The pollinia stick to the fuzzy eyeballs of the moth. And the flower is asymmetrically uh, belt, basically. So it forces the moth's fuzzy eyeballs into contact with the pollen sac, plenius, as the orchids speak for it. And it sticks to the fuzzy eyeball of the moth. And then when the moth pulls away, it pops off. And when the moth goes to another uh, crane fly orchid, then it, you know, it, it bursts on that plant and the stigmatic processes of the orchid uptake the pollen and pollinate it. So moth by uh, pollination of orchids by fuzzy moth eyeball. That's getting pretty explicit. That is. And I mean, I always knew that, or not always, but I've known for a long time that the orchids, our native orchids, were often pollinated by moths. And we've got crane fly orchids all over our farm because we've got part woods and part fields, and they're all in our woods. But I never, I didn't realize until I was reading your book that it was the pollen's getting transferred on the eyeball. I mean, I know some butterflies transfer pollen, other species transfer pollen like that, but I didn't realize that that was what was going on with the crane flight orchids. I thought that was so cool. Oh, if I were you, I'd stake out some of those plants in July and try and get pictures of the moths going to it. That's my next step too. But now I have the pollen on the eyeball of the moth, but I haven't seen the actual process occur. But uh, you're lucky to have that orchid. It's a really cool plant, but all orchids are neat. But uh, you're exactly right. Moths are doing the heavy lifting totally here. Um, as a matter of fact, here's one more quick story about a rare orchid. Uh, in Ohio, we have about five sites for the federally threatened eastern prairie fringed orchid. It's one of the rarest of the rare, you know, federally threatened. And I got permission to go to a site one night where it was in peak bloom and sit out there in the dark hoping to get the sphinx moth coming to it. So these big platanthera orchids, the big ones, uh, like purple fringeless orchids, these sort of things have uh, long nectar spurs, tubes that come off the base of the flower and they're really, really long. Like we're talking two inches maybe. And the nectar reward is in the base of that. So the only thing that can get it, and it's pre-selected, evolved to pre-select sphinx moths basically, is these sphinx moths that can hover because there's no landing pads. They have to hover in front of the flower and then have a proboscis long enough to plumb the depths of that nectar spur. So I, there was little data on which sphinx moths are pollinating this federally threatened orchid. So anyway, I sit out there and then all of a sudden it's getting pretty dark. I think I'm on a fool's errand here and I'm getting eaten up by mosquitoes. And all of a sudden this wraith just comes out of the dark, big sphinx moth comes right to my orchid that I'd staked out and went around and plumbed every flower. You know the moth too, everyone does, who grows tomato plants. The tobacco hornworm or tomato hornworm, it's incorrectly called, that eats people's tomatoes plants. And many, many of those have been killed in the name of preserving non-native tomato plants. But that's a native moth, the Carolina Sphinx, as it's called as an adult. And that's what was plumbing this, uh, pollinating this uh, federally threatened orchid. So oh, wow. people who have tomato plants, and I like tomatoes as much as the next person, but sacrifice a few to the hornworms if they come, if you're so lucky as to get those on your tomato crop and let them have some because they become a wonderful native component of our lepidopter yes and i i was often wondered what else they what they kind of became and what they pollinated because i mean i knew they were a native species i just wasn't sure what else what all how else they fit in other than um as a food source for the parasitoid wasps that mm -hmm. um, are always parasitizing them and for some reason i just never actually got curious enough to look it up, look that one up. And I don't know why, because I'm always curious about all those things, but for some reason that one never hit me. So thanks for sharing that. Oh, sure. And if any, I've, I've got a blog. If someone just Googles my name, they'll probably go right to the blog. And that whole story with pictures is on there somewhere. 
and it's easily searchable so that people could see that moth at that orchid if they wanted to see it. So anyway, the, even the lowly uh, unloved moths, especially unloved moths like that one, um, they're serving important purposes. The book mentioned in this video, Gardening for Moths, a regional guide, is a book that everybody that is gardening for pollinators should have in their library. Even though it is focused on moths, any of the planting recommendations apply to native bees and butterflies as well. Jim is also a great photographer and the pics in the book are awesome. I will put a link to Gardening for Moths in the description. Jim has plenty more great moth stories and some awesome moth photography advice in the podcast this clip was taken from. And you can listen to the whole discussion right here in this video. And be sure to take some time and enjoy nature in your backyard.